You're listening to That Gratitude Guy podcast with David George Brooke. That Gratitude Guy. Learn about how gratitude turns what you have into enough through stories of motivation and inspiration. Wherever you are in your life and whatever you're going through, That Gratitude Guy is here to help you achieve great things and live a happier, healthier life. Change the way you live today right here with David George Brooke, That Gratitude Guy, starting now. Well, hi, everyone. Welcome to That Gratitude Guy podcast. I am David George Brooke, That Gratitude Guy, your host, where my mission is to have guests that relate and recall moments of their lives that were propelled and energized by utilizing the power of a gratitude mindset. You can expect to get some tips and takeaways from each of my special guests. My podcast is downloaded every Tuesday morning at 5 a.m. Pacific Standard Time on the Transformation Talk Radio Network, and it's available on Apple, Spotify, Google, or any other places you get your podcast. Uh, Please subscribe and give me a five-star rating if you like what you hear. That's always appreciated. And also, I do gratitude keynote speaking and gratitude coaching, and you can reach me at thatgratitudeguy.com or email david at thatgratitudeguy.com, and I'll have that information in the show notes as well. So let me get on with the show and introduce you to my special guest this week, Jody Lentz. Jody Lentz is a powerhouse in the field of life and disability insurance, women's empowerment, mentorship, and community service. She is currently a financial representative and brokerage manager for Pacific Advisors working in the Western U.S. Jody has spent over 28 years serving her career and company with passion and has grown several advisors to new limits. Jody also serves as the past chairperson of the Board of Governors for the Columbia Tower Club, a business club, and is a current board member. Also a board member for Toys for Kids organization in Seattle, Jody has won several leadership awards personally or professionally, I should say, and community service awards. She has a passion to help people they need, however they need, and make a difference in their lives financially. Jody has raised three successful, fantastic sons and has seven grandchildren and resides in Bellevue, Washington. Jody, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, David. So I appreciate you having me. Well, it's great to have you here. So one of the things I always start off my podcast with, for those of you that have listened to it from time to time, is to give people a context, the listeners and viewers, and that is, how did you and I meet? Well, I remember one day, well, we can rewind the clock about probably 12 years ago or more. And I think you were brand new in being a guest speaker. And my business partner at the time said, we had this phenomenal speaker today at our Rotary. And he was so great. I just loved him. And I think that you could probably benefit from having him in some of your meetings and different things that I would have. And his name is David George Brooke. He goes by that gratitude guy. So I knew of you, but didn't know how to get a hold of you. Somehow or another, I may have had your email wrong. Um, Doesn't matter, but one day I was up at the Columbia Tower Club and that's where you and I met. And I had an advisor who worked for me who said, oh, I see my friend, David Brooke. I want you to meet him. He's phenomenal. You'll love him. So the rest is history. Got to know you that day and a little bit following up, you spoke for uh, the company that I was working for at the time, and we became friends. You've also been my coach more than one time and part of a, your mastermind classes. So, yeah, excellent. Thank you for those kind words, too. That's very nice. And certainly remember Lawn Davidson and speaking. That was way back in the beginning when I started out this journey to be a speaker and so forth. So, speaking of journeys, so talk a little bit about kind of I like, I don't want people to go back to grade school and junior high and high school, but kind of the the high school on college, what have you, kind of your career. I know some of your uh, details of your career journey, but kind of start out what was most memorable for you. I know you've done modeling in the past and so forth, but what really sticks out in those early years of starting, of course, you were a mother with three, eventually three sons, but in terms of in the work world, what, how did that first start out for you? Gosh, I... I'm not even sure where to begin with that. I I think for me, I learned to make friends fast, as fast as I could anyway, because if I do rewind that clock to the time I started kindergarten, um, I'll I'll back up even further to my parents got married super, super young. 
And my father graduated high school, went into apprenticeship school, when my mother never got out of junior high before she got married. Um, bottom line, we traveled so much with my dad's work that if I look back, I went to 10 different schools and actually could probably even go further than that, but 10 different schools in that 13 years of going from kindergarten to 12th grade. And I wasn't at a school more than six months or a year. So you learn to make friends fast. So it was always a little bit outgoing, um, even though deep inside, I felt like I was pretty much of a shy person. But if I didn't go out and meet people, I didn't have any friends. So going from there, I ended up in high school and I went through some family issues with my father getting sick and our life changing dramatically. And my sister at the time happened to be the model of the year competition winner. And she won a uh, contract with Breck in New York. And she was a Breck girl. She moved in and pursued her career in that. She ended up getting me into that industry. So I thought it was a great industry for many reasons. And, and at the time it allowed me to work when I could work. Um, I too got married a little bit young. I go back to some of my favorite days. It was the traveling for about seven years with professional baseball, meeting great people in um, crazy cities all around America and friends that are still friends today. It's where our oldest son was born on the road in Amarillo, Texas. But I, I guess I have those great memories. I then opened up my own business in the agency world and met a lot of great people. Um, but my life changed when I was 32 and I sold my business and decided to stay home and then ultimately started this career. And I think when you go back to, you said, you mentioned, I learned to make friends in, in 10 different schools and so forth. And it sort of forces you, I get, well, I guess it doesn't have to force you. Some people could choose not to see that as an advantage, but anytime that you were able to meet new people and be able to relate to them on a fairly quick basis, I think not so much in the modeling, but I think later as you got into an insurance, uh, that probably ended up being a really big factor. And don't you think that early school thing was part of the thing that made you ultimately, which we're going to talk a majority of a time about, but so good in the insurance business? Definitely. I think people will survive our industry or they don't survive and they hate it. And bottom line, it's all about building relationships, making phone calls and you know, reaching out to people. So if you can't do that and you're not comfortable and you know, okay with some of the rejections, it's really a hard industry to follow. Yeah. You know, I think it also helped me in high school. I was a cheerleader. I always say I have three sons that were very successful in baseball and very athletic. And people often ask us, oh gosh, where do they get their athleticism from? And I always say, of course, their mother, because I was a cheerleader all through high school. You know, I also ran track, but um, I think, you know, some of those things, whether it was cheerleading or whatever, I've always been a cheerleader, not only from junior high through high school, but also, you know, with all three of my boys and, and um, always looking to how can we, you know, impress the crowd and, and get more crowd involvement, doing posters, hanging things, doing spirit nights, et cetera. So. Right. And to kind of keep it in chronological order, I want to, before I get into the insurance, because that's the bulk of what you've done, and I know there's a lot of tips and tricks and just things, and I know about your attitude in terms of gratitude and being somebody who's very appreciative of what you've been given in this life and so forth. But prior to that, I just, I'm thinking about the parents out there. and I happen to know from knowing you that uh, your sons, three sons are all very successful and all married and all have, you have grandkids with all three of the sons and the granddaughters and so forth, or grand. Um, daughters-in-law, I should say. But what, what kind of, I know it's a big question, but kind of go back to with the man, fact that they're so successful, what, what do you think were some of the keys that made them? I guess we, if we said it in the beginning, we'd say we can't do this because it'll jinx it. But if we look at it now where they're pretty well up in the years, uh, 30s and 40s, if so forth, um, it's pretty well established they're doing pretty well. What do you think were some of the keys to what made them so successful as they are now? And I think Raising kids is always a little bit of, you know, it's one of your biggest chops as a parent. And I go back to, we had a little bit of a motto when the kids were younger. And we had a little bit of spread out in, in the kids. Ryan, our oldest, was like seven years older. And then the two younger boys were just 20 months apart. So they were all involved in, in different athletics, soccer, um, football, 
baseball especially, and that started becoming year round. And with three kids going different directions, our one night of the week was Sunday night. And the rule on Sunday night was you have to be home for dinner. If you wanna bring a friend or drag kids in, that's fine, but you have to be home. We'd go around and talk about what the highs and the lows of the week and, and what can we do to support each other. And our motto was always, winners never quit and, winner, and quitters never win. Um, so we, we kind of lived a little bit by that of being committed and committed to your team. And, and you know, if you're going to join something, then you need to be, you know, all in. But not only that, when I changed careers and stayed home for a little while when our youngest was born, uh, I have felt like my life changed. I had a, a health issue that changed my perspective. And I thought my boys, my family is my priority. So I will never miss their parent-teacher conferences. I'll be a room parent. I will not ever miss any of their, their games, their baseball games. So I think that being very involved in their life and we raised our boys in Woodenville. And in many ways, that's a little bit of a small community. And especially when you get into the athletic arena. So I always felt like the boys can't really do much, go anywhere, do anything that they're not gonna be seen by someone. So a combination of just being hands-on, making sure your kids know how much you love them, supporting them in their endeavors. You know, I see so many people when I would go to, whether it was little league games or high school football games and, you know, different events that your kids, it's a big deal to them, but yet there was never any family member that would attend on their behalf. Right. So I always felt like, you know, that's, that's a priority. And, and I know that doesn't have anything to do with school and being successful, but they learn so many different things about life and lessons and commitment and determination and, and you know, being disciplined that I think it really helped them. Well, and I think you brought up a lot of good points there. And one of them is like, it's an example of Sunday night dinner. And I think about the, I talk in my speech about the uh, silver linings of the pandemic. And we've gone through this pandemic. It's coming up on two years now, next month. And one of the things which was a silver lining to me is people started having dinner together again. And it forced them to be home because they weren't at school or they weren't at work or they were doing things virtually and stuff. And so, gosh, I grew up with, with dinner every single night, not to mention Sunday night dinner and, and something that so few families seem to have anymore. But, but I think that's just really a good example of, of good parenting. And, and that's why I'm always looking for tips and tricks and whether it's parenting or the insurance industry or your charitable efforts or whatever, it's so important to know what some things that maybe are takeaways that somebody can have. And I think with kids being the very proud parent of two sons, 37 and 27, I look back and it's just clear to me, not too many times, but I've just seen some people that just didn't get the parenting gene. It just somehow just didn't seem to get into their, their DNA or something. Because I remember when my youngest left for college and I cried at the airport for an hour and a half. And, and I mentioned to somebody else about, did they have a tough time when their youngest, oh no, it's time for him to leave. He needed to go. It's time for him to go to college. And I went, wow, that's pretty cool. So it's just really different. But so as you raise the kids, and as I said, they've all been very successful uh, personally and professionally. And then, so talk about kind of, you mentioned you had a health challenge, but also changing careers. Talk about the decision to go and you had the modeling agency and, and sort of the transition from those things into the insurance business and what kind of your mindset, how it got you into that place. I was in that modeling industry for, gosh, I'm going to say 12, 13 years. And I think it's definitely a career path for the right person. Uh, for me and for many people that I know, it has a great way of sucking every bit of confidence out of you. So sometimes, you know, that comes with challenges. But at the same time, I was gone and I was doing a little bit of travel. I ended up buying, um, or not buying, but owning an agency and representing models. And I was in my 30s. I was also doing television commercials and a member of SAG at the time, Screen Actors Guild. Uh, so I did some travel and we had a nanny at home and our youngest was probably about a little over a year, year and a half, something like that. And I got to a point where traveling a lot was a requirement for me and I couldn't avoid that. But one day I, you know, got a news that I was, had malignancy and was going to have to go through surgery and uh, treatment, et cetera. And I thought, you know what, that's when I made the, the decision that 
I'm, I'm not going to do this anymore. My family is more important because you drive home from the doctor's office and you start thinking all the things in your head of, oh my gosh, I don't know if I'll even see my youngest go to kindergarten. I won't see my kids graduate. You go through all of those things, not knowing what the outcome is going to be. And that really truly changed my life. So shortly after surgery, I was on the phone and, and met with a couple of people, sold my agency, and I was done with that. And I stayed home for a couple of years and I just decided that I like getting uh, or going to work or getting dressed every day and going somewhere and learning something new. I, I think that it's great for people who are, you know, very committed to being an at-home parent, whether it's a, a, a home father or mother one way or the other. For me, I just had a thirst for knowledge and I just wanted to learn. And we had a life insurance agent come over to see us to do an annual review for our own policies. And he said, gosh, Jody, are you going to go back to work someday? Or what are you thinking? And, you know, at that moment, I thought, you know, I'd love to go to work. But with the criteria I had, who would ever hire me? And he said, I'd love to have you meet my general agent. And I thought, are you kidding me? Life insurance? Oh, my gosh. No way. I'm no way going into life insurance. So it was completely by accident. I drug my feet for a couple of months and our agent, Nick, called us a few times and said, hey, Jody, he hasn't heard from you yet. And I finally, out of courtesy to our buddy, Nick, um, I made that call and I had every intention of saying no. And then it was this challenge of, I just want to see if they would hire me so that I could say no. And they did hire me and I didn't have the heart to say no. I thought, I'll just give it a week and tell them it's not a, a good fit. And the thing that's so funny and what I have learned from you, David, is you talk often in some of our coaching sessions that you and I have had even of passion and purpose. And if I go back to some vulnerable times in my late teens, um, my father was diagnosed with cancer and he died uh, when he was 36 and he was only 34 at the time that he was diagnosed. And there was a three month window in his life where he had no medical insurance, no life insurance because he dissolved the partnership in his company and was gonna launch his new company. And all of our insurance was always done through the business. So that three month window was a complete game changer for my family. And that became a little bit of a passion for me that I will never in my life go without medical insurance or life insurance because I saw what it did for my mom and me for the most part. And even to a certain degree, my sister, she was a little bit older, but I was 18 when my dad died. And I realized I had already registered to start school at the UW and I had to quit and go to work full time to help my mom pay bills. That became a passion for me to make sure I never let that happen. And when I kind of rewind the clock and I started going through these classes um, and got licensed and going into this business, I thought, there's so many people out there that need my help. There's a lot of people on this, this podcast viewing, if they look at it, that are never going to give you five stars for an insurance agent. But, you know, I, la I laugh about that because we're like gum in people's hair or shoe or whatever. Um, but at the same time, when people need it and it's not there, that's when you realize the value of it. And I was one of those people that it changed my life. It changed my mom's life. And it was a huge game changer in my family. So it didn't take me long to figure out. I had true belief in that product. I had true belief in helping families, whether it was a disability or you know, a, a death in your family, because my motto is you should never have to grieve a death and stress financially at the same time. It is like double whammy, horrible stuff. So if I can help people with that, that's, I have found a passion for that. And my purpose in life is not so much trying to sell people insurance, but um, at least to educate them. You know, I, I was never a teacher, but I feel like educating people and knowing what's right for them, I always do the right thing for my clients. I'm not out there to sell insurance. I just want to help people with whatever it is that they need and, and direct them in the right place. So it is all about them. It's not about me. It's so important. And you mentioned too, just a little sidebar, uh, your father was 36 when he passed away. Thinking back on that, I know it's a few years ago, but what, what, 
what helped you through that? Because that's certainly, you were 18 and that's certainly young. And uh, do you recall about some of the things that helped you, the mindset? And of course, I always talk about gratitude, but the things that helped you through a, a very challenging time like that? You know, I think when I was 18 and going through that, I didn't even know the word gratitude for the most part, in all honesty. And I feel like it was, I was just trying to figure out how do I drop out of school? How I, I can't afford to go. I was working, so I took my job on full time to help my mom pay power bill, garbage bill, whatever it is that I could contribute to. Um, and I had a car and a car payment and, and those things, but it was just more um, helping my mom through her grieving process mm. and the financial stress that it put on the two of us. And I remember it was probably, you know, fast forward a little bit, it hits you at different times where I just think I don't have my dad to walk me down the aisle at my wedding. Um, my dad was always hoping that his second child would be, or even his first, would be a boy. And he ended up with two daughters. So when I, every time I had a baby and it was another boy, I would always cry a little bit, wishing that my dad had the opportunity to meet my boys. He would have loved yeah. them. Yeah. So, you know, I think it came in waves. So I don't know what it really was that helped me get through that as much as it was, I was always busy. And I'll tell you, it was then that I looked in the yellow pages thinking, holy cow, if I got killed in a car accident, my mom can't afford to bury me. What is she going to do? Yeah. And that's when I bought my first life insurance policy as I was 18 years old on my own. Um, so, you know, going back to that, the life insurance industry also gave me the ability to have the freedom and the flexibility and to earn, you know, whatever I wanted to earn, little or a lot, depending on how much I wanted to work. And the freedom flexibility, uh, flexibility was probably my priority because of my family until my kids were gone. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think, too, going back to the insurance thing, I, I, know your, I know parts of your story. And I think about, there's a lot of people, when I was growing up, the person that this was in the 50s and 60s, but the typical model uh, there's no such thing as divorce back then. It was just mom and dad and mom raised the kids and dad worked. And then we'd have family dinner, as I mentioned earlier. But I remember thinking as I got into my 20s, wow, is that how it works? And you just work for one company for 40 years. And so you've had an interesting journey. And I think it's very inspiring to people to know that if you get work for a particular company or an industry or whatever it is, and then you stay with that, it works out great. But if it doesn't, you try to improve yourself. So talk a little bit about the journey from, I believe it was Northwestern Mutual way back when with Lawn and so forth, just how that kind of went for you. Because in my opinion, I'll let you tell the listeners and viewers, but it just seemed like every time you made a change, you were definitely improving yourself. I feel like I've, I've been on a good journey for learning the industry. And, and I learned from, you know, I started my career as a recruiter. So I was recruiting and then helped with some of the development and retention of newer people in the business. And it's really, there's, there's a word called financial services, like Northwestern Mutual Financial Network. It's always all about the, the big word financial services. That is like such a gigantic global ball in many ways, because a lot of things fall under financial services. But people specialize in different things. They either are disability specialists, life insurance specialists, um, investment specialists. They do assets under management only. Um, it's all over the map, you know, whether it's estate planning and trusts and yada, yada, yada. But I started as a recruiter for a few years and I was pretty good at it. I had, um, and I usually don't pat myself on the back that easily for that, but I was lucky enough to have 28 to 35 recruits per year. And we had retention awards that we won. So I had some you know, great um, support from the home office of Northwestern Mutual. And I you know, passed up on a opportunity that they passed my way to, to go to the home office and be their vice president of recruiting. They were gonna move my family to Milwaukee. And my kids came screaming, oh my gosh, we're not moving to Milwaukee, no way. Um, so bottom line, I got to a point where I thought, I feel like I've mastered this, so I think I want to become an agent. That's when I got licensed, became an agent, and um, I ended up leaving there and becoming an independent. And during those independent years, I just wanted to learn all the other companies, not just the one that I was with, because a lot of my peer group 
weren't fitting into that box of the insurance that was offered by by Northwestern. Not that it's not a great company, it's a great company, but you know, they wanted, I, I had some hospitals and doctors and nurses, and they were all over the map of different product and services. So I went on the independent route and I learned a lot from that. I had also great mentors through that process. Then I went into being a sales manager. So I went on the management track a little bit with one foot in the water of still being a financial advisor and one foot being in management. And from there, I decided I like that management track. I like the ability to recruit and I still do my own personal production, but I like the, the recruiting and the training and the development and the management roles that I've taken. So it's been a great journey for me. I was a regional vice president for you know, Ohio National, as you know, for a few years. And it was just great learning, great experience, great people. And you know, being part of the top part of the company and seeing the inner workings of how companies work and what they do has helped me a lot from you know, also being able to help train and develop other people. So I've learned a lot. It's been you know, a great journey along the way, so. Yeah, and I think too, I mean, every time it's kind of like the square peg, square hole, it's, and as you said, this company, Northwestern or Ohio National, whatever good companies, but it's kind of how it fits with you. And, and I think too, I'm just making some notes of some different little things that you've said about, uh, I'll mention it at the end too, but one of the things I really know is true with you, and you mentioned helping your mom when you were younger, and helping people, and that's certainly in the financial world. And part of that comes to do if you want to help yourself, help other people. Something I believe in very strongly and do a lot myself, which is very rewarding, but uh, a good journey for learning. I like that too. So uh, one of the things I want to we'll, we'll, we'll go another five, six minutes or so, but I, I would be remiss if I didn't bring this up as part of your journey uh, through life. And this actually kind of relates to gratitude as well, but as your charitable efforts, I remember getting to know you and hearing a lot about what you've done. So talk about some of those things that you did. And as importantly, maybe is the motivation behind it, because I've complimented you a number of times on the things that you've done. And I said, you just, just trust me, not everybody's like that. You know, it's, it's a rare bird, in my opinion, that can work hard and raise kids and do all these things and be a good part member of the community, but also really help out the community. And so talk a little bit about your charitable journey and how that kind of fit into your life. I think it started back in the 90s when I when I first went back to work um, or actually after I had my first little roundabout with um, my health issues back in the early in my early 30s. I thought, how can I give back? I don't want to, you know, sit and, and help, you know, clients that come in or patients that come in, you know, being treated and, and volunteer in that manner. But because I knew a lot of people from, you know, just being in the community for a long time and my kids and their, their um, athletics that they were involved with. Um, at the time, my husband was with a large company, and there were a lot of people in the wholesale clothing industry that I knew. So from the relationships that I had, I always felt like I want to give back, but more on the development side. So two things. Our middle child, when he was born, our middle son, was born and, and had a heart defect. And he was in and out of children's a lot growing up. So we were at children's every six months for years and then every year for years. So I would see a lot of these kids that weren't healthy and they weren't, you know, as lucky as other kids, I guess is the best way to put it. Um, we also had a little bit of a scare with our oldest son who spent, you know, a few months in the bone tumor clinic at children's. And so we've had those things. And I always felt like, how can I give back to a community that has given so much to us? We, we, at the time, were, you know, lucky to have our health every day and go to work every day. We weren't rich people, but we were rich in family. We were rich in our health. We were rich in, you know, all the things that we had for the most part. And a lot of people aren't. And I had a soft spot in my heart. So I started, I think, in my first philanthropic role down, down in the development arena was with a hutch. And because I had a background in baseball and my, my husband was a professional baseball player, I helped with the Hutch Award and I ultimately was the chair in a, like within about a six month window of time. And I ran that award for years. And we went from 
you know, having 40 people at the first event to 1,200 on the field at Safeco every year after that. And I was successful at putting a great team together and, and good support and all of that. That was a lot of fun, but I have always felt rewarded from that. And they were very generous and, and thankful that I was part of that. Uh, and then it ultimately over time, Rick Riz, who is a close family friend of ours, I've always been helping as much as I can with him and his, uh, his, his charity is Toys for Kids. It's started by Dave Henderson and, and Rick Riz and Jay Buner and uh, I think Edgar Martinez. They felt like no little kids should ever go without a Christmas gift. And so it started off just being, you know, they would play Santa Claus every Christmas. And now we do an annual gala event. So I have always felt strongly that, you know, charity is something that begins at home and it's a learned uh, behavior more than you aren't really born into that. But if you learn that and you realize how blessed you are, how grateful you are for so many things that you have, you know, that was one of the things if I could go back in, in time with even my mom, I'm so grateful we were both healthy enough, strong enough, close enough to figure life out. How is she gonna go back to work? How are we gonna make this all work? And you know what we did, we didn't have any options. So, you know, it's either bury your head in the sand and, and have a pity party for the rest of your life and, you know, live on the streets or whatever is gonna happen or you learn to pull your big girl panties up and make it work, so. Oh, that's good. I'm just making a note of them. And they have a couple of these as we wrap up too in a minute. Uh, one, one more thing around the charitable thing is you mentioned in your bio or the, as I read about your kind of connection with Columbia Tower Club. And I feel that kind of ties into the same charitable aspects, but, but what's been your view of that? And then as recently as chairman, and I think your term is just about over, uh, what's been your experience of that in terms of charitable and the kind of people you've connected with there? We became members of this club about 18 years ago, and it was really kind of a little bit of a legacy following of um, our uncle, who was one of the founding members years ago. And it was just a very cool, fancy club to come here and entertain our, our out-of-state relatives. We have a lot of family from Kansas, which is where I was born and, and raised part of my life. And, and also um, special events through the years, and especially since I've been in the insurance business, I love having meetings up here because it's a view that is like second to none in the Northwest and one of the tallest buildings west of the Mississippi. But it's also a great uh, networking club, a, a great business club. We put on events that help give educational value or entertainment value, one or the other. So multiple different clubs, as you know, David, you've been a speaker up here before. And I have, was asked to be a board member probably about six or seven years ago, at least. I might have been longer than that. So I've served on the board for a long time. And then I was elected as chairman of the board. And it, it is a, a lot of volunteer work. It's not, it's not a paid position by any stretch. But I've met some incredible people. Um, I've been able to host great events and bring people to the table that speak like Dan Evans or, you know, different people that I think are really instrumental in our community and pillars in our community. So it's just expanded, you know, the audience that I ever knew before. And I love that because I feel like I, I learn from people, whether they are famous or not famous, you know, you can sit and chat with someone and and I always feel like I learn different things about people. I, I met you and I feel like there are so many different times that, you know, I could just go want to kick a hole in the wall somewhere because I'm so frustrated or my business sometimes can be so hard or what do I do? How do I get through this? And from your coaching, I've always been a fan of coaching. I put money into coaches and I have for the last 15 years because I find that hugely important for my own personal growth, my confidence, and, you know, to help me feel like, you know, you, you might have fear, but you got to overcome that fear. So you just go get up on the stage and make it work. Right. But I've learned a lot from you on how do I deal with those days? And I'll tell you, I, I can hear your voice over and over sometimes of, um, you know, what are you grateful for today? You know, and, and learning that what you have is enough and all the different messages and, and different things that you've helped me with. So yeah. anyway, yeah. 
Thank you. Columbia Tower Club is how I met you. I guess that's a good thing. Yeah, no, that was that's excellent. Thank you for that nice endorsement of my coaching practice too. So, well, we're going to wrap up, and I want to just go through a couple of the uh, sort of tips or takeaways, kind of that I have. I, I wrote down several things that I really liked, um, especially uh, when we talked about insurance and never grieve a death and have a financial struggle as well. And I think, and you and I have chatted about insurance before over the lifetime, and I've had a love, hate, not love, hate, but just see the pluses and minuses. And then uh, some people that they want insurance when it's too late, now they can't get it because they've got a terminal disease or what have you. But uh, this whole concept of how you helped your mom, I think is really cool and helping people. You've always been a, a really huge helper, if that's, if I can say that that way. Uh, I really like the comment about a good journey for learning, which is so important. I've mentioned many times about there's two types of people in this world. There's the lifelong learners, and then there's the know-it-alls. Uh, neither one of us are particularly fond of know-it-alls. Lifelong learners are the best. You're always learning. I had a day today that was just jam-packed with things I learned when I was so excited about, too. But also, uh, with the charitable things, too, how can I give back? I mean, what a great question to ask. And kind of having a soft spot in my heart, I think, is really cool. And, and maybe one of the last things, speaking of gratitude, is... Uh, and I know, unfortunately, your mother passed away uh, re somewhat recently, but the grateful you are for the relationship you had with your mom and your dad was very young when he died in 36, you were 18, and you had your mom for a lot longer, but just having that relationship, and that's what I always talk about with gratitude, about, you, know, you always put it in the lens of gratitude turns what you have into enough, as you just said, well, how many people had no relationship with their mom? Uh, my parents died pretty young, and I'm still jealous of people that still have their parents, and my mom and dad have been gone 40, 50 years, respectively. It's like, wow. And so I just dealt with it. It's how it works. But I'm so grateful for the fact I have health, and I have two fantastic sons, et cetera, et cetera. So, so with that being said, um, I would like to end up with my favorite question at the end is always, what do you know when you get to pick one thing? What do you know today that you would have liked to have known at 18 that would have helped you? a huge question. Holy cow. Um, I think I wish I had known how, how much more I had in me that I was too shy or too afraid or lack of confidence to move forward. I look back and I think I could have accomplished so much, but I didn't set my sights high enough and I didn't have anybody in my life at that point that I felt ever pushed me, you know, because that would have been my dad who would have done that. And, you know, unfortunately he wasn't here and I felt that res responsibility of being there for my mom. But I think, you know, if I wish I had more confidence when I was 18 because it would have taken me further, but I'm truly am content of where I am today. But sometimes you just go backwards and you think, gosh, I wish I had known that then. I wish I had known, you know, different things about, you know, multiple topics. I could say, I wish I had, a, had eaten better. I loved Twinkies, believe it or not, all through my 20s and 30s um, and ding dongs and whatever. But I also wish I had invested more in real estate. I wish I had traveled a little bit more. Um, yeah, there's just a million different things yeah. that you wish you had or wish you knew, but well, I guess uh, confidence was my biggest issue. And, that's a good one. And, I, and I think too, I was going to give you a hard time to say, I said, pick one thing. I didn't say, give me the whole list. No. I know. I but know. The I thing know. is, that's is that it. it's, it's just, it's such a, in the time that I've known you and I've watched your confidence improve and change and grow a lot. And, you know, it is true. Um, I wish I had much more than I had in me back then. And it's easy to look with hindsight as they all say 2020. But we, you've heard this cliche before, but I, I just think it's so true about the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. The second best time is today. So you can always improve and make today a better day. And there's something about confidence in yourself that just works so well personally, professionally in your whole life when you feel good. That's one of my favorite modules, find yourself, find your talent, find your passion, find your purpose. It's my second module I talk about in my talks. It's so important because the better you have that relationship with the person in the mirror, everything in your life just works better.
So, so thank you. That's a very good answer. So, well, thank you, Jody. So let me wrap up by telling everybody a couple of things I mentioned earlier to wrap up the podcast. My podcast is downloaded every Tuesday morning at 5 a.m. Pacific Standard Time on the Transformation Talk Radio Network and is available on Apple, Spotify, and Google. Please subscribe and give me a five-star rating if you like what you hear. And I know that people are struggling with all sorts of life issues. And so I do have a coaching program. And Jody was just talking about the coaching program. My gratitude coaching program will give you a coach that fully believes in you and can propel you forward to achieve anything your mind can conceive. The support you receive is unmatched in getting you to believe in you and making changes that you've been wanting and needing to make. Whether it's your finances, your relationships, your career, or your life's journey that you want to change, then this is a great program for you. Gaining a complete understanding of your challenges, asking powerful questions, providing guidance, and a very high level of accountability, which is very important, along with an attitude of gratitude all combined to ensure your personal success. My six-month proprietary gratitude program is available to my podcast listeners with not one, but two extra months free if you heard about it on this podcast. And as I mentioned earlier, it's available and you can get a hold of me at thatgratitudeguy.com. I should say thatgratitudeguy.com. And also you can see in the background thatgratitudeguypodcast.com as well. And one last thing, if you'd like to receive my weekly gratitude video every Monday morning, the Monday morning minute goes out at 6 a.m. in the morning. And it's a, a 60 second video message to start your week off on the right note. And how you get that is go to your text and go to the text box and then the number type in 22828. That's five digits, 22828. In the message box, type in gratitude guy, all one word, hit send. It'll send you a link and you will be signed up. So thank you so much for tuning in for both viewing on the YouTube and for listening on the Transformation Talk Radio Networks. I'm David George Brooke, that gratitude guy. And remember, be grateful and never quit. So long. Thank you for listening to That Gratitude Guy podcast with David George Brook, where living with gratitude turns what you have into enough. Transformation starts now and you have everything you need to achieve great things. In a world that is constantly changing, there is motivation and inspiration right in front of us, and you can find yours right now. Don't wait. Visit thatgratitudeguy.com to get started living with gratitude today.